How much different was Destiny 1 from Destiny 2? Now, I want to take you down memory lane real quick because I know we got some new light players, but if you're like me, it's just been a while, right? Destiny 1 launched in 2014. It's been a hot minute, but I wanted to take today's video to just kind of remind everyone, whether you're new or old, what Destiny 1 was like. Now, September the 8th, 2014 was the last normal day of my life. And the reason for that is because of September the 9th, Destiny 1 release, which resulted in me as a grown man sitting in my living room in my underwear playing a video game all day long. I remember the girl at the time I was dating went to work that morning and came back home and the first thing she asked me when she came in was if I had went to work that day or which I replied no. Hence why I'm still in my boxers. Now eight years ago started this journey and we had no idea where it was going to take us. Many of us are still playing here today though. Still shooting aliens, still dismantling them blues, still emoting in the tower, still grinding for that loot. But Destiny has changed a lot since 2014. So let's take a glimpse back at what Destiny was even like like back then. Let's talk about how the game's systems and mechanics changed throughout the years and then touch on what we still want to see transition to Destiny 2 from Destiny 1. First off, looking back, Destiny 1 feels like a completely different game now. And if you don't believe me, fellas, go boot up Destiny 1 right now. You'll be like, oh my god, this game feels old. Now obviously, there's the big stuff that I'm sure lots of you remember if you did play Destiny 1 and if you didn't, if you're a new light player, you get a nice idea of what the first iteration of Destiny looked like. Like I was saying, the big stuff. Also, keep Keep in mind that these first few things we talk about were never changed throughout the life cycle of Destiny 1 either. So first up, Destiny was only on consoles originally, and it was on the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, the Xbox One, and the PS4. I'm pretty sure an Xbox 360 and a PS3 would literally die trying to power one of Destiny 2's raids. Now we have very limited settings, as in like none. No controller bindings or key binds, terrible field of view, no sliders, 30 frames per second, but we still loved it, right? It's crazy. Now Grimoire cards was tracked outside of the game with lore cards. This was a nightmare because there was no way to view collectibles in game or follow the storyline at all. Which is why when all my friends would ask me, hey man, what's the story like in Destiny? Of which I would just say, bad guys are bad because they're bad. The darkness. Now the entirety of Destiny 1 only had strikes and crucible for its ritual activities. Again, this is before Gambit was even conceived. Now character visual customization was also a lot more limited. No transmog, you can only use one shader. That's okay though. We we had glow who but yeah it was very very limited in its character creation however back then each subclass was actually fully customizable from the get-go of destiny and you had to actually unlock subclass perks by gaining experience but you had the freedom to build your subclass with tons of different options essentially what you see bungie doing right now is us getting back to that in destiny 2 with void solar and arc 3.0 now back then class abilities didn't exist you only had grenades melees and supers but you know i got like hunters right now going yo you couldn't dodge? That's right, you roly-poly bastards. At least in year one, you had to walk on the ground like the rest of us. Now, activity rewards were given during an activity summary screen after every single activity completion. These rewards were always random, and sometimes you would get absolutely nothing, while other people would get double loot drops. It was always fun watching the bottom frag in the crucible get an exotic, while you, who just slayed the entire team three times over, got absolutely nothing. RNG, baby. Faction reputation. You could also gain faction reputation with the likes of Dead Orbit, New Monarchy, and Future War Cult by completing bounties while wearing a faction's class item. And ranking up each faction gave you faction themed rewards. Again, factions were a big deal, man. There were many weapons from Destiny 1 that were faction related that I remember to this day. Now, strikes also had specific loot drops that you could only get from certain strikes. So popular ones were things like Amago Loop, which dropped from the Undying Mind Strike during Dart Below, Grass and Malak from Omnigal. We also had that really cool Cool Scion Elemental Hunter Cloak, kind of like the one we have here in Season of the Risen Ranks from the Dust Palace Strike. Now, Ammo Synthesis was also a thing back in Destiny 1. That's right, you would outright purchase Ammo Synthesis and you can pull out ammo from it. Special ammo, heavy ammo, primary ammo. Now, raids didn't have races back then. There was still worlds first, but it's definitely scaled a lot more since Destiny 2. Now, the only way to hit max light level was to actually acquire gear from in-game activities, like the raids. There was no way to become overpowered like there is now with the artifact. And if you wanted in-game activities to be easier, you had to complete those in-game activities. I remember early on, this was such a big issue to players because they didn't want to do those in-game activities to reach that max light level. Also, Gallahorn was the king. Still really, really good in D2, but it was like the king of kings. If you didn't have Gallahorn, you couldn't find a team, which sucked because RNG was so punishing. Funny enough, Gallahorn was actually sold the very first week Destiny 1 was released. The problem is, is nobody even knew 
knew who the hell Zer was. So none of us bought it. Now let's talk vanilla D1 leveling and loot. Now most of these features were eventually updated through the years, but this is how it began. This was the early days of Destiny. The UI and menus we have now in Destiny didn't exist. Everything was handled on one screen, quests, bounties, inventory, everything. Talk about a cluster. The only way to hit max light level was also to acquire gear from in-game activities like raids and level 20 was actually the max reach through experience and light levels from wearing higher rarity armor brought you to level 30. There was no triple or quadruple digit power levels like we have in D2. Not yet anyways. Planetary materials. This had to be literally farmed for hours. You had to go to each planet, look for the crops of planetary materials on those planets. So spin metal was on the Cosmodrome, helium filaments was on the moon, spirit bloom was on Venus, and relic iron was on Mars. By the way, there was no ghosts indicating the locations of these materials. You literally just had to memorize the material farming routes for each one of these planets. There was no way to purchase these materials until the quartermaster started selling them, which was much later in the game's lifespan. Now, each class also had their own upgrade materials. Sapphire wire for hunters, hydronic essence for warlocks, and plastic plating for tanks. Yeah, Bungie introducing a ton of materials is nothing new, man. We were juggling a lot of different things back then. Now, you ready to get pissed off? Raul had this funny ability that when you decrypted Ingrams with them, there was always a chance that you would just get materials instead. He also had this unique ability where he can either give you lower or higher level rewards. Blues could literally turn into legendaries, but legendaries could turn into blues. And because of this, the loot cave was born. Later patched before Dart Below. But yes, this was one of those things that really made us scratch our heads when it came to RNG. You could also get gear for any class, no matter which class you were playing on. And this is like before Destiny Item Manager. So you want to talk about an inventory nightmare? This was it, man. And you always had to go to Raul to decrypt. None of this auto decrypting when you pick up Ingrams like we have now in Destiny 2. Now, during this time, all Crucible game modes except for Rumble had vehicle maps with turrets that people desperately wanted back in D2. There were some crazy good maps back inside of Destiny 1 that to this day, I don't understand why they have not been ported here to Destiny 2. Now, depending on what level you were at the time, this actually dictated what strike playlist you had access to. These were split up into four different playlists based on your current level. You had the Vanguard Eagle at level 18, Viper at level 20, Wolf at level 22, and Tiger at 24. Now, Nightfalls were also much harder and would send you to orbit every time your team wiped. Basically, similar to like Grandmaster and Extinguish. Yeah, y'all remember Void Burn with Fogoth? Now, if you manage to complete them, you get a cool little blue flame around your character's head so everyone knew how much of a badass you were. These flames were essentially the titles before titles existed. Now, the game also had something called the Weekly Heroic Strikes, which weren't nearly as hard as Nightfalls, but would still reward you with strange coins, as well as Vanguard Marks and Legendary Ingrams. Back then, strange coins were used to purchase powerful gear from Xur, and Vanguard Marks were used to purchase legendary loot from the Vanguard. Same goes for Crucible Marks, which were obtained from playing the Crucible, and can be used to purchase legendaries from the Crucible. Later, after Taken King, these marks would be molded into one item called Legendary Marks, to make things simpler. Much like Glimmer, marks were shared across all your characters. Now, you also gotta remember that for a while in Destiny 1, each class only had access to two subclasses. For the Hunters, you had Blade Dancer and Golden Gun. Golden Gun is still in Destiny 2. Blade Dancer is pretty much like Spectral Blades, just an arc version with the ability Blink, which we think is gonna come back in arc 3.0. Titans had their Bubble Super, No Sinno, and Fist of Havoc, which by the way was only one smash. Yeah, no roaming super here, man. Warlocks had Nova Bomb, but they also had Radiance. That's right, self-res Warlocks. You literally will die and come back to life. This obviously broke many mechanics in the game. Bungie had a nightmare, establishing mechanics. Trials was also a mess with self-res Warlocks, but eventually we got kind of used to it and we could counter it. The question we have here lately is, will self-res Warlocks ever make a return in Solo 3.0? Now, the Warlock self-res and Hunter Blade Dancer were truly class-defining supers. You want to talk about IP-defining? Both of those were, which is why it is odd we don't see them inside of Destiny 2. I do think we could potentially see the Blade Dancer back, but as far as, like, the Warlock self-res, I don't know, man. You've got a complete split in the community on this one. Like, if we were to take a poll right now, guarantee 50% of you were like, yeah, I love chaos, and the other 50% of you think logically. Now, let's talk about loot. Back inside of Destiny 1, weapons and armor were XP base, meaning that you actually had to unlock the perks on that weapon simply by using the gun and wearing the armor. Then once you gain enough XP to unlock said perks, you had to spend planetary materials, weapon parts, and motes of light, ascendant shards, and ascendant energy to activate those perks. Exotics 
also required exotic shards to fully upgrade. You didn't just get the perks for free like we do now. Fellas, you had to commit to the grind. You had to marry it, which quite literally led me to losing my job and my fiance at the time. But hey, I was able to upgrade my last word and it was so nasty back then. So well worth the trade off. Now, like I said a second ago, we didn't have dim. We didn't have destiny item manager, but literally we had nothing. You had to manually go to the tower, put your items into the vaults and then swap to your next character, go back to the tower and pull it. There was not this, oh, I'm in a raid. Let me just pull this out of my vault from my phone or some third party app. No, sir. You had to stop what you were doing, leave the raid team, go get whatever it is that you're going to get and hope to God you make it back in time to that LFG team before they replace you. It was stressful. Now, exotics were also incredibly rare. None of this do a couple of lost sectors. You get new exotics that we have right now. Exotics were so rare that people used to do entire videos dedicated to just opening a bunch of exotic ingrams. Some exotics were so powerful that if you didn't have them, nobody wanted to LFG with you. Cough, cough, Galahorn. Icebreaker was also another one that if you didn't have it for certain nightfalls, nobody wanted you. And this was really a dark time for Destiny's community because it was a hard wall for people trying to find groups to play with. And if you think RNG is punishing now, let me just say it like this. Galahorn took me, I think, six, seven months before it finally dropped for me. And when I say six, seven months, this is six, seven months of me playing every single day. Now, Bungie's kind of way of combating some of this RNG is they did give us some exotic quests, starting off actually with three of them. One of them was super good advice, which was a machine gun, not that good. The other one was invective, which was a shotgun that created its own ammo, which I honestly think is one of the sexiest weapons ever created and would love to see it. And the other one is pocket infinity, which was busted in year one. The reason why I didn't really get that much attention was because, well, everything was busted. Literally everything was busted. But these quests were also super rare to get. So despite there being a quest, it was RNG just to even get the quest. Now let's take a quick leap into the future with the launch of the first Destiny expansion, The Dark Below. This was released on December the 9th, 2014, and not much really changed with this expansion as Bungie was still trying to get feedback from the community and already had this release planned out before the launch of the game. So nothing really changed as far as like the game systems and mechanics. I will say one of the annoying things back then though was like content releases as well as reset was like 3.30 or 4.30 in the morning. Dude, it was so early. I remember being up at like 3.30 rating December the 9th, which getting an LFG team is hard enough. Getting an LFG team at damn near 3 a.m. Next to impossible. Now level 32 became the new light level cap, which was a whopping two level increase. We also got new campaign missions on the moon. We were introduced to Eris Morn as both a character and a vendor. They also added the sword relic as a weapon usable in the campaign and in the raid. And speaking of the new raid, Crotus Inn was added with this expansion. So we got a brand new raid just three months after the launch of the game and the launch of Vault of Glass. Now Crotus Inn, despite a lot of people memeing about this raid and saying it's essentially just a dungeon, was really the first raid to show everyone how powerful a guardian can be. SC Slayrich, the legend himself, was the first person to solo this raid. And it was the first time a guardian even soloed a raid. And up until this point, none of us even thought that was possible. Someone soloed a raid? I actually didn't believe it. I remember getting the link sent to me and I was like, yo, this is such a lie. Look at this guy click baiting. And I watched the entire thing start to finish and was mesmerized. Now, outside of that, Crotazen also added another layer to glitches when it came to mechanics with bosses, most notably pulling the ethernet cord out when Crota would spawn in. Depending on who the host was, if you pull the ethernet cord out at the right time, somehow this would stun lock Crota and you can kill him easily. There was all kind of cheeses happening at the time, but this one was very out there and I never could actually get it to work and we tried a bunch. To me, when it came to like cheeses, I think the Templar cheese was by far the easiest to do because you could just throw solar grenades at the Templar and literally just push them right off the map, which would give you the win. Now there were other things added like new loot to chase and new exotic armor. Back then, each expansion would add at least non-exotic armor pieces and once again, they were also hard to obtain. The Dark Below also introduced the famous Omnigal Strike. Everybody loves those screams, right? We also got new Crucible maps like the Cauldron, which is now inside of Destiny 2. Four new exotic weapons were added and among these were the popular skill gap No Land Beyond, which was a sexy sniper rifle that had the ability to always snag headshots. We also got the Dragon's Breath rocket launcher, Necrochasm, and of course the Fourth Horseman. And last, but certainly not least, Dart Below brought with it the first ever sparrow that could do tricks, and that is the EV-30 Tumbler. What a time to be a Destiny fan. Am I right? Now, House of Wolves. Some people say this is when Destiny began its ascent to becoming really a PvP juggernaut, which I know is crazy, right? A lot of people look at Destiny and think of it as a PvE game, but House of Wolves pushed everyone to play PvP. And on May the 
18, 2015, it launched just a mere five months after Dark Below. And unlike the first Destiny expansion, House of Wolves didn't introduce a new raid, but it did bring with it some changes to mechanics, as well as brand new activities, locations, and a new weapon type. First, our level was raised to level 34. We also got new campaign missions, where we teamed up with Marsav, Petra, Varix, and the Reef to fight a war with the Fallen. The Vessian Outpost was also added as a social space in the Reef, which I used to love chilling at. Varix, Petra, and Brother Vance were also added as vendors. Varix for Prison of Elders, which was super challenging. Brother Vance for Trials of Osiris, which I know some people are like, yo, Trials is in Destiny 2. What's the big deal? Dude, back then, Trials, for some unknown reason, just captivated the masses. Everybody wanted to play Trials. It was such a hit. And Petra was added for the general expansion theme items and weapons. Now, Prison of Elders was the in-game activity this time around instead of a raid, and it was a three-player activity, making it a little easier to get a team together for it. You would fight against waves of enemies and themed rooms of each enemy race, high, fallen, vex, cabal, while also completing objectives like disabling mines. You also had the Warden Servitor that we killed in the Prison of Elder Strike called the Warden of Nothing in Destiny 2. And it's the same Servitor that ran the Prison of Elders and told us what to do during each round in Destiny 1. And at the end, you would open up a golden chest if you had a skeleton key. Now, this game mode was really liked by pretty much everyone. Skolas was probably the boss many remember, and it was quite a feat to take him down. We also had the Scorch Cannon Relic that was added to the game. Sidearms were also added. That's right, we didn't have sidearms until now. Now, Trials of Osiris was really what shook things up on the PvP side of things. It was 3v3 elimination, managed by Brother Vance and the Reef. Flawless trip to the Lighthouse required nine wins in a row. Pretty much the same passage upgrades that exist today were available for purchase back then. Things like Boon, Mercy, and Favor. And this felt like the first real in-game PvP activity. And it brought a lot of players either back to the game or to just try it for the first time, as this was the new competitive format for the Crucible. Overall, Trials at this point was very well received, guys. I was playing it every single weekend and we would play for hours. I actually considered myself being a PvE player and just kind of dabbled in PvP from time to time just to pass the time. However, Trials with Cyrus made me dive headfirst into PvP. I wanted to learn the meta. I wanted to learn what subclasses were the most potent. And by God, we definitely got to experience some nasty. Bike and funeral, fireball grenades, thorn and last word. Trials of Osiris was a nasty time. And it was a lot of fun because everybody was learning together. Now, once again, this expansion brought even more new exotic weapons and armor to chase. Nine more new exotic armors were added. You also had exotic weapons like Lord of Wolves added, as well as Cream Breaker's bow. More crucible maps were also introduced like Thieves Den and Widow's Court. And Tanix was first introduced with the Shadow Thief Strike. Yes, all the way back then, we were dealing with Tanix. He survived for over five years and somehow ended up in space where we found him during the Deepstone Crypt raid, but this time as a shank. Also, weapon upgrading became a thing with this expansion. A new currency called Etheric Light was added to the game, which was used to ascend the power level of legendaries. You would actually obtain this new currency through in-game activities like Prison of Elders, Trials, Nightfalls, Iron Banner rank-ups, etc. This was a beautiful time in Destiny, but it only got better. In September of 2015, everything changed when the Taken King entered the scene. The Taken King is known as one of the best expansions to ever hit Destiny, and some still think it's the best ever, even including Destiny 2 expansions. Now, the Taken King not only had an epic raid, although I gave my opinion about it last week, where I stated it was overrated, but I will say narratively, it was perfect. We were able to take down the Taken King Oryx himself, and it also brought massive overhauls, brand new subclasses, and new locations, new modes, and a new enemy type, as well as gameplay systems, a new weapon type, and Gallahorn was finally sunset. The Taken King was one of the best times to be a Destiny fan because the game changed so much and there was absolutely a ton of stuff to do. Now here's some things that Taken King added. A complete overhaul to the leveling system. Now you can reach a max level of 40 just from XP and the light levels were completely separate from the character level and tied to your gear. Now the max light level you can now reach was 320. Ghosts and class items now had perks and contributed to your overall light level. Now the first sunset. Again, this is not a new concept. I know we had sunsetting here recently or a couple years ago, but many weapons were phased out and unable to make the light level jump to the Taken King. And this included good old Gallahorn, as Bungie didn't want a dominant exotic that was required for all in-game activities. This wasn't as destructive as the recent like Destiny 2 sunsetting because of the massive amount of content that we got in return. And only the weapon's ability to level up to the next power level was removed, not the actual content of the game, which I know. Destiny content vault, sunsetting, it's a difficult thing to jump justify. Now, the first ever infusion system was added to the game, very similar to how it works in Destiny 2. The collections were also finally now a thing, 
allowing you to reclaim previously dismantled gear and track what you didn't have yet. We also got a full quest page where we can manage our bounties and quests in one spot, new campaign missions on a brand new location, one of the best Bungie has ever made, Oryx's Dreadnought. And the Dreadnought was very similar to like Destiny 2's Dreaming City, being one of the best locations ever, filled with secrets, hidden chests, paths that you can only see when you took out your ghosts. Chests that require weird items like mysterious runes and keys, calcified fragments, litter everywhere that you have to find to get Touch of Malice. Hadium Flakes led you to getting your first ever legendary sword. And the Court of Oryx was Destiny's first ever publicly activated activity that required items to activate and had rotating bosses. Basically, the Blind Well equivalent. Now, the Taken were also introduced, hence the Taken King. Swords were also introduced as a heavy weapon with three legendary swords as well as three very iconic exotic swords. Raised Lighter, Dark Drinker, and Bolt Caster. Class specific exotic weapons were also added for the very first time. You had to lock for Warlocks, which was disgusting. Fabian Strategy for Titans, which never really got nasty. And Ace of Spades for Hunter, which was pretty good back then, but it's even better now and it's not exclusive to just Hunters. Now we also got three new subclasses, one for each class, fleshing out every class with an element that they were missing. And the first new subclass ever added to Destiny. Titans finally got Sunbreaker, Warlocks got Storm Trance, and Hunters got Night Stalker. Now each of these missions were actually handcrafted for each subclass and rich in history and class identity. That makes like Destiny 2's generic one quest fits all stasis acquisition somewhat uninspiring. Now Rift and Mayhem were also added to the Crucible and a lot of people still want Rift to come back. The Festival of the Lost was added and I know some people may not like the event that much now but it was incredible back then and I still get into the festivities. Factions and Legions was also added where you can now rank up your chosen faction without having to wear specific class items. You just had to choose to pledge to a certain faction and running any activity would grant you faction rep. Now along with this the Taken King brought a whopping nine crucible maps. Nine! Can you imagine us getting nine crucible maps right now? We also got four new strikes including the popular Shield Brothers strike where you had to fight two big Cabal brothers at the same time and once one died the other one would pick up his fallen brother's weapons and combine them with his own. And we got the Son of Cell strike where we first met the now Light Blade in Destiny 2. Back then he was Dark Blade and you had to fight him in a pitch black arena with Curse Thrall everywhere. Sparrow Racing Ling was also added into the game during the Taken King a few months later in December. And for my new light players that are wondering what the hell that is, it's exactly what it sounds like. Racing, but with sparrows. It came with two race courses and we got brand new awards like racing themed armor sets and sleek new sparrows. Not only lasted three weeks and only returned in December of 2016 before disappearing forever. Rest in peace Sparrow Racing League. Now alongside that, 11 new exotic armor pieces were released and this expansion brought with it a total of 17 exotic weapons, including iconic ones like Black Spindle, Zalo Supercell, Sleeper Simulant, The Chaperone, Telesto, No Time to Explain, The Jade Rabbit, and of course the three exotic swords. Oh yeah, also Eververse and Silver as a real money currency was introduced with the Taken King. Now at the time, the only thing you could buy was emotes. Now Eververse at the time was really not a problem. There were players that were concerned. I know Data was concerned about it on where Eververse would go in the future. But lo and behold, guys, we haven't seen a direct pay to win option. But I will say Eververse does walk a very thin line in Destiny 2 when you do look at things like season pass leveling purchasing. But that is definitely a topic for another day. Now, seven months later, we got the April update, which was a massive update. This is essentially the equivalent of what we get today in seasons. Now, again, seven months, which is a big content drought. But the update dropped in April 2016 was a free post Taken King update that increased the max level and added a couple more to the game in an attempt to keep players busy until the next expansion. We got light level increases to 335. All activities granted, loot capable of 335 light. And prior to this, the only way to hit max light was to do in-game activities like raids. They also remastered some strikes to include Taken. Prison of Elders added a challenge mode. Chroma Glow ornaments were added to armor. And a super dope Taken armor set was added for each class. A number of year one sunset weapons were also brought back into the game. And Elder Sigil scorecard, similar to strike points for platinum rewards, was also added. Now the last Destiny expansion arrived five months later. Rise of Iron was the final big piece of content added to the game. And it brought a light level increase to 385, a campaign mission throughout two new destinations, Fellwinter's Peak and the Plague Lance, which was essentially just part of the Cosmodrome, but with snow and lava. We also had a story based around Lord Saladin, as well as the Iron Lords and Siva. Now, Fellwinter's Peak was added as a new social space. We also got record books, which is like the early version of Destiny 2 Triumphs. And we also got the precursor to the current artifact systems in Destiny 2. Now, these 
eight artifacts provided different benefits. But you had Memory of Felwinter, Memory of Gillian, Memory of Yoder, Memory of Perun, Memory of Radagast, Memory of Similar, Memory of Scory, which by the way, literally broke trials, and Memory of Timur. If I've forgotten how to pronounce some of these names, forgive me. It's been a minute. Scory was the main one I remembered. That one and Felwinter. Now, Archon's Forge was also a new wave-based fighting arena, which was added in access in the Plague Lance. Similar to like Corda Oryx, but with Siva. Now, it was kind of a new enemy type, but more like semi-new, right? It's just fallen and fused with Siva. Now, we did get the Iron Battle Axe added as a relic. A mission with the Blizzard was also added, which is like a precursor to the dynamic weather system that we saw in Beyond Lights. The first ornament system was also added that allowed you to change visuals of some specific armor sets and exotic weapons. Private matches for Crucible was finally added. And of course, we had the Wrath of the Machine Raid, which was personally one of my favorites. Beautiful raid, great set pieces, and a dope boss fight with fantastic music. Along with this, we also got the final drop of new exotic weapons and armor, the last four Crucible maps to ever be added to Destiny 1, a remastered Galahorn that wasn't very good. Yeah, Bungie made sure of that. Three new strikes and the Supremacy Crucible game mode, which was actually very fun. Now, Bungie wasn't quite done here yet. Not until the final update when Age of Triumph hit in March of 2017. Age of Triumph didn't increase the light level or add any super substantial amount of content, but it did breathe some fresh air into the game to hold over players until Destiny 2. We got revamped raids on a new raid rotation. We got raid armor sets, which were remade with crazy cool glow effects and special ornaments that everyone wanted to collect. And fellas, let me just say they were dope. Raids also pushed the 390 light, complete with challenge modes and a few mechanical changes. Several raid weapons could now drop as adept versions and were given exotic level rarity. They also added an Age of Triumphs record book with goals to check off or complete that span the entire game. Now that's mainly it for Destiny 1's lifespan and what it was like back then in terms of systems, mechanics, activities that were available, etc. Now to be quite honest with you, there was a lot that D1 didn't have. It didn't have seasons like we have now. No artifact leveling, no submachine guns, no bows, linear fusion rifles or glaives, no stasis, although that was probably a good thing. No crazy Eververse, where you could easily spend hundreds of dollars if you aren't careful. No Gambit. I don't know. Maybe we should go back to not having Gambit. I take it back. I love Gambit. There's a lot of areas where Destiny 1 walked, where Destiny 2 could run. And honestly, those mistakes should not be brought forward into Destiny 2. Things like console exclusives. Didn't like that. We saw a little bit of that in Destiny 2 as well. Sunsetting things. They brought it forward and the community hated it. Laborious material grinds, which Bungie is really corrected in a lot of ways. Content droughts, which I know going through this whole span right here, you're like, yo, Destiny 1 had so much content. Fellas, no, we had huge content droughts in Destiny 1 when there was literally nothing to do. We have a tendency, guys, to look back with rose tinted glasses and think, oh man, the good old days. And believe me, I love Destiny 1. It will always have a special place in my heart. But whenever I go back and I play D1, it just makes me realize how far D2 has come. Now, there is still some things that I and I think most of the community would still love to see carry over from D1 into D2. Some of those things being strike specific loot. That was strike theme, rarer and worth the grind. A more fleshed out subclass system, which we are finally getting. Void 3.0 has restored my faith in our subclasses. And I think Ark and Solo 3.0 are going to be amazing. And the potency that aspects and fragments present is even more so than what we had back in D1. Sparrow Racing League. Look, it doesn't have to stay here constantly, but the throwing in would be kind of fun, right? Why not make it competitive? Why not give us red shells and blue shells and maybe some green shells and maybe a banana and perhaps a rainbow course. Rain armor that looks as dope as the Age of Triumphs gear. I don't know if we're ever going back to that, right? Dude, it was so dope though. I love that the Vow and the Disciple raid though has gear that moves and stuff. So that's kind of cool. But those glows and those special effects from D1 were amazing. I wouldn't mind seeing Rift back. An objective game mode that I think most people would still not even play. They would probably just sit there and farm kills up all day long. But I just want them to bring Rift back for everyone just to play and go, oh, well, this is crap. More maps. For the love of God, we need more Crucible maps. And there's so many from D1 that could be brought back to D2. The old D1 tower. Now listen to me. I think the D2 tower has served its purpose, right? But I'm ready to move back. D1 tower was way superior. It had a doper view. It was that eye in the sky. And I know it got blown the hell and back, but come on, who's working on this project? It's taken forever for us to move back. And of course, Twilight Garrison. How can I forget? Yeah, I would love to see Twilight back. Titans, we need it. Overall, Destiny 2 has been able to run because of the changes that we saw in Destiny 1. And a lot of things Destiny 2 has improved on way beyond what we even imagined. I like where D2 is today. We're in a situation now where we just want more. And if Bungie can focus on that, D2 will continue running for a very, very long time. So guys, that is our recap for what D1 was like. Let me know in the comments below what you think. We like to do these big girthy videos right here. So big shout out to Jarrett who handles all of these major edits for 
us. And by the way, if there is a topic you want us to dive into, feel free to comment it below. And if you're new here, subscribe, man. We cover everything in this game, including some other shenanigans. Fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching. And as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right. <laughs>